We cover lots more on that, how they did not make life in the laboratory on our videotape number four, where we deal with 20-some lies in the textbooks out of our blue series of tapes. Our fishy friend returns. Fifthly, we would have to have macroevolution. Macroevolution is the evolution in separated gene pools. In other words, if there is no gene flow, it's macroevolution. In an evolutionary context, species are delimited through independent lineages, i.e., no gene flow. This means that, contrary to Mr. Hovind, speciation is a macroevolutionary process. In a much more contemporary sense, macroevolution is a term describing the observation of phenotypic change. And, for the record, yes, it is observed quite often. Just flip through a family photo album. That's where one animal changes to a different kind of animal. Not a different species, but a different kind. If Mr. Hoban knows what a kind is, he's certainly keeping it a secret. Let's all wait with bated breath. We all know what great example is next. No one's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. It requires a profound misunderstanding of basic biology to make the leap that Mr. Hoban has made in attacking evolution in this way. Contrary to Mr. Hoban's claim, closely related species often look very similar to the untrained observer, or in this case, even the trained observer. The gray-cheeked thrush and Bicknell's thrush were only recently discovered to be separate species. And in this case, it's a very important distinction since Bicknell's thrush is considered threatened. But the evolutionist has to believe that the dog came from a rock. In reality, biologists and even many scientifically illiterate members of the general public know that domesticated dogs are the result of selective breeding of wolves. If you go back far enough in time. Actually, it would be the last common ancestor. Domesticated dogs are easily traced back to wolves. Wolves can be traced back through Canidae to Caniformia and Canivora through the Miacids about 42 million years ago. Miacids were primitive members of carnivora descended from other eutherians. Eutherian is just a big fancy word that means mammals. From there, the phylogeny of dogs follows the phylogeny of mammals, all the way back down to the last common ancestor. Not a rock. And it happens slowly, of course. Unless you're from Harvard, then it happened quickly. That was a poorly veiled attack on the late Stephen Jay Gould. Dr. Gould was a profound paleobiologist who put forward a hypothesis of rapid bursts of dramatic change, punctuating slow, constant change. While it is easy for Mr. Hovind to utterly butcher Dr. Gould's work before a largely ignorant audience, we prefer to allow Dr. Gould to explain punctuated equilibrium in his own words. A new species can arise when a small segment of the ancestral population is isolated at the periphery of the ancestral range. Large, stable central populations exert a strong homogenizing influence. New and favorable mutations are diluted by the sheer bulk of the population through which they must spread. They may build slowly in frequency, but changing environments usually cancel their selective value long before they reach fixation. Thus, phyletic transformation in large populations should be very rare, as the fossil record proclaims. But small, peripherally isolated groups are cut off from their parental stock. They live as tiny populations in geographic corners of the ancestral range. Selective pressures are usually intense because peripheries mark the edge of ecological tolerance for ancestral forms. Favorable variations spread quickly. Small peripheral isolates are a laboratory of evolutionary change. What should the fossil record include if most evolution occurs by speciation in peripheral isolates? Species should be static through their range because our fossils are the remains of large central populations. In any local area inhabited by ancestors, a descendant species should appear suddenly by migration from the peripheral region in which it evolved. In the peripheral region itself, we might find direct evidence of speciation, but such good fortune would be rare indeed because the events occur so rapidly in such small populations. Thus, the fossil record is a faithful rendering of what evolutionary theory predicts, not a pitiful vestige of a once bountiful tale. It all just sounds so reasonable when the person describing it understands the concept. Sixthly, we would have microevolution. If macroevolution dealt with isolated gene pools, microevolution must work within the same gene pool. The shifting frequency of alleles within a population describe the observed changes. In a contemporary sense, microevolution is used to describe genotypic change.
This is where animals change within the same kind. Ah, uh, the kind. Mr. Hoven's best kept secret. But wait! Common descent with modification is a prediction of evolution. Oh, now this one happens a lot. Creationism. Sometimes it's only a few decades behind reality. Following the advent of modern genetics, the terms macro and microevolution fell out of use in the scientific community in the late 1930s and early 1940s. By understanding the role that DNA plays in life, biologists understand that those processes are not different or even complementary. They are the same. I don't like the word microevolution. I think it's a confusing term. We ought to just call it a variation, but they call it that, so we're kind of stuck with it. At least he somewhat resisted the urge to fall back into strongman arguments. The first five definitions are religious. Only number six is really scientific. We're not quite sure where this non sequitur originated, but that is the nature of the fallacy. Maybe it stems from Mr. Hoven's pathological fear of searching for actual publications. So they're going to give kids examples of number six, and there are billions of those, and try to make them believe that that proves the other five. This one seems to be doing quite a bit of projecting. Unlike the claims made by Mr. Hoven, scientific claims are supported by evidence. And that's how they're winning the argument, folks. The sad reality is that most of the general public is ignorant of evolutionary biology. And, well, biology as a whole. It is this ignorance that creationists like Mr. Hoven prey upon. So, after that fun romp through nonsense, what is the actual definition of evolution in a scientific context? Evolution is the change in the frequency of alleles present in a population through time. Oh, and just for the record... We make a lot of videotapes, over 700,000 videos we've made now in several different languages, none of them copyrighted, 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 none of them copyrighted. Not without a sign that maybe things are getting better, or it's a sign that frankly it's a little bit sad that Americans don't come to it by things like this.